We've now entered the month of December. In the home stretch of 2021, the holiday season, and all of the built up stress and overwhelm and resentment that has built up over the course of this year finally reaches its pinnacle and climax. Happy December, everybody. I know it seems a little melodramatic, but the sad part is it's reality. According to the Mental Health Foundation, between 16 to 19 percent of Texans alone have suffered from a mental illness or dysfunction this year alone, with only 11 to 14 percent of those Texans receiving care and treatment for their mental illnesses. The, the pandemic continuing and surging throughout 2021 certainly hasn't seemed to help any of us, with 70% of Americans expressing concern regarding the pandemic and its consequences on their family, their health, their job status, our nation's economic status, supply chains, and so many more other struggles. Around 64% of Americans have anxiety or growing anxiety regarding the pandemic and its outcomes. Shootings continue to happen in schools by teenagers or on the roadways or even between neighbors. And I say all of this to say that as a nation and as a county and as a community, I don't know that we are entering into the home stretch of 2021 any better than we entered into the beginning stretches of 2021. In fact, many experts are concerned that as life appears to return to some sense of normalcy, all the anxiety and stress that has built up over the past 20 months will be released in unhealthy manners. News reports and articles have been coming out since 2020, rising, raising the alarm of increased domestic violence cases, homicides, and other violent acts as stress, anxiety, and mental illness, and many other factors have built up in our community over and through the pandemic. And this isn't a policy issue. This isn't something that's solved by more regulations or laws, or even less of them. This is an issue of the heart. So this week, we're going to look at stopping the Grinch of bitterness by freely forgiving. And I would encourage us to consider the real life, real life application of this purpose as we live out as live out our purpose as disciples of Jesus Christ, as he lays out specifically in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Because this is a very real need in our communities. It's a very real need in our own homes, even amongst us as disciples of Jesus. And it always will be. But especially this year, I think we have one of the greatest opportunities in maybe the last 20 years to change the tide to move the needle, to do it noticeably different for the sake of our neighbor and in love for them, for each other, and for our Savior, Jesus Christ. So grab your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Normally I would tell you to take your neighbor's Bible if you need to, but not today. Grab yours, grab your phone, grab your tablet. If you need to look on with your neighbor, you're certainly welcome to do so. Matthew chapter 5, go to verse 38. This is from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You see, the, the Roman authorities and soldiers at this time had every right to ask a Jewish individual specifically to carry things for them up to the equivalent of one mile. Roman pres presence in Israel at this time was at best a calm, occupying military force. But there are laws in place that clearly put them over and above the Jewish people and every other indigenous people in the region. And so what Jesus calls his disciples to do is to make a choice in freedom. He calls them to carry the tunic two miles or to turn the other cheek 
or to even give more than what is required for you to give. Why? Because the moment you make the first step in mile number two, you are doing it out of the freedom and love. Out of the opportunity to choose the other person first. And at that moment, the Roman soldier, or whomever it may be demanding of something of the disciple, loses all power and authority and tyranny over them. Because you cannot control somebody who chooses to do something out of love. And then Jesus continues the thought. Go down to verse 43. You heard it, that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same thing? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. See, in our family relationships essentially demand that we love our parents, our siblings, our grandparents, whatever the family relationship may be. And there is very real dysfunction existent in families that break these relationships apart. But when love is not present in these relationships, or it's a manipulated love in these relationships, we don't really see them as healthy or natural, right? Okay. But it's completely natural that I do not have to love a person outside of my immediate relationships. To do so is a choice. It's a choice to be a good teammate in the office or a calm customer at the counter, or a pleasantly safe driver on the road. And you see, in making that choice, there is a freedom that cannot be taken away from us. Because again, you cannot control somebody who chooses to do something out of love. And Jesus is calling those who would be his disciples to do something in freedom. And to do something in freedom that cannot be controlled. He's calling them to make the choice of love when there is no obligation or requirement to do so. He's calling his followers, his disciples, to love as he loves. And this is the struggle with the gospel that so many people have. It's that it can't be manipulated. It can be twisted, and many have for generations, but you cannot control the reality that God loves each of us so incredibly much and has for all the generations of his people throughout time that he chose to break into our world, into our existence in the most humble of forms, and he lived a life in the midst of his people. He suffered crucifixion at the hands of the occupying Roman authorities because of their fear of the religious leaders of the time. And he chose to die under the weight and the burden of our sins. Once and for all. To claim our victory over sin, death, and the devil with his final breath. You cannot control that God has chosen to pour out his love for each and every one of us, sinful, broken, and often wretched as we might be, to call us his beloved and redeemed and adopted children. And you cannot control that God, in his great love for us, in Jesus Christ, has promised us eternal life with him and a resurrection where there is no mourning or crying or death or pain anymore, for the old order of things has passed away, and behold, the new has come. You cannot control somebody who chooses to do something out of love. 
this is the love our Savior calls us into as his disciples. And brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what our world so desperately needs this year. And every year in reality. This reality never changes that the, that the world needs love poured out that is not manipulated, it's not controlled, it's not earned, but as everyone comes out of a constant state of stress and anxiety, it's probably more true this year than it is others. And this is where you and I get to step in and living out our purpose as disciples of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we heard it just a moment ago, the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. For behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. We regard no one according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16. So let me ask you a question. Do you and I respond differently to the world around us? Do we respond all that differently when somebody cuts us off on the highway? Or when they're driving like Sunday drivers and it's Friday afternoon? Or when they take too long at the register? Or when they get our order wrong at the restaurant and it's 12.30 and we're ready to get home and watch the football game? Or when we feel like they haven't given us the attention that we think we deserve from them? Or when we have expectations of their behavior in our minds, but we never actually share those expectations with the person, so inevitably they don't meet our own expectations of them. Do you and I respond differently when we've screwed it up? When we are the ones who have done it wrong? When we've gotten angry? Or when we feel hurt? Or for those of us still in an office environment, do we foster accountability in our teams and in our offices out of love and growth? Or do we do so out of control and power? Those are just some of the questions we can use to explore this. But the reality is, if you're like me, too often the answer is no to those questions. No, we do not respond any differently than the world around us. which fellow disciples of Christ is a concern that we should all have. Because in a season when we talk and we sing about hope and joy and celebration, too often we're feeding the narrative of the culture around us instead of proclaiming the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. We have to stop the Grinch that comes when we choose to live outside of our purpose as disciples of Christ, when we choose to live for ourselves instead of love. So I invite you to consider the choice that Jesus is calling us to make and the good news of love and grace that he pours out to us. No, the choice is not choosing Jesus, okay? We're good Lutherans at Peace Lutheran Church, and we understand that Jesus has chosen us in his death and resurrection, and we are transformed by his spirit working faith in our hearts. The choice that he's calling us to make is that of faithful obedience. A choice that cannot be controlled, overruled, suppressed, or ever taken away from us. He's calling us to love the world around us. As difficult and as burdensome as that might be, as he loves us freely and without shame. That person taking too long at the register, that could be you on any other given day. Or maybe it was you at the store that you were at previously, and that's now why you're running late, getting frustrated at the person in the register in front of you taking too long. No, that's not a real life story. That person that cut you off on the highway could have been you on any other day, especially if your boss had called and said, hey, if you're tardy one more time, you can expect your job to be on the line. That coworker that seems to hate the entire world could be you too if you had a family that mistreated you most of your life or constantly verbally abuses you when you walk in to the door or the entire time you've been working at this company seems to have passed you over promotion after promotion after promotion. 
Or maybe they are just an embittered, angry person for no other reason than they woke up on the wrong side of the bed that day. Has that ever been you in the morning? You see, what Jesus calls us to as his disciples and the choice that he calls us to make is to remember that every single person we interact with in the world around us has a story that only God knows. Just like you and I have a story that only God truly knows. Yet he freely pours out his love for us in our lives. And he calls us to make the choice to do the same in the lives of others. Because that simple act of love, that simple choice of love, can redeem them from a story that has long defined them as anything but worthy of love. You cannot control somebody who chooses to do something out of love. And there's a consequence to this that I think we we do well to remember. It's that you cannot control the transformation that love brings. This is what Jesus knew. His love would bring a transformation of the world that no authority has ever been able to stop. Not the Romans, not Hitler, not communist China, communist Russia. No authority has ever been able to stop the love of Christ and the transformation he brings. Ever. So we can stop the Grinch this season by number one, This is going to be a challenge for some of us. Smiling more. I try to remind myself more of this in this season than any other time of the year. Because there are plenty of opportunities throughout the year to be angry, sad, stoic, frustrated, whatever. But disciples, this is a season of anticipation. This is a season of joy. A season of excitement. Because God broke into our world. So smile. And especially when you're anxious or when you're angry. I don't believe that problems are simply solved because because I put a smile on my face. But I can promise you, snarling or glaring at each other certainly doesn't help solve it either. So if you're doing that to me right now, stop the Grinch and number one, smile. Number two, give your pain to Christ. This week I had an incident that actually made me practice this. For almost an entire day's worth of time, I had to pray, Lord, take this bitterness from me. Because I was internalizing something that was not mine. (laughs) And it was going to make me bitter, and it was going to lead me to stop smiling. And you want to know the crazy part? The Lord actually answered my prayer. I woke up the next day in a much better position with the situation that I had gone to bed. And what turned, it turned my next day into a new opportunity. A new opportunity to actually make the choice to love and freely forgive. Because Christ changed the narrative. And here's the crazy part. Because I gave my pain to Christ, I didn't put it on somebody else. I didn't put my pain on somebody else with angry words or angry actions. I stopped the spread of the pain. And I stopped it with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord willing, he's creating a new avenue in this relationship. Smile more and give your pain to Christ. And number three, say thank you. Yes, you are shopping at the store or you're buying that coffee, you're ordering that meal, whatever it is, it brings that company business, and yes, in a roundabout way, you are paying that employee's salary. But brothers and sisters in Christ, be different. And say thank you. Because in saying thank you, you actually show respect and honor towards the employee as a human being, who could be in a vast number of other places including a beach somewhere sipping a Mai Tai. So say thank you. 
Because it might be the only thank you they get in that shift that day. And be generous in your thank you. What I've always found interesting in the Gospels is nobody but the religious leaders ever question the sincerity of Jesus' heart. I pray the same can be said of us, his disciples too. So stop the Grinch by smiling more, giving your pain to Christ, and saying thank you. You cannot control somebody who chooses to do something out of love. And you also cannot control the transformation that love brings. In his most precious name, amen.